of the macro environment was not conducive to gold. That's now clearly beginning to change. We First of all, we've had the rate cut. Gold always moves since 1980. Gold has always moved or since after 1980, I should say. Gold has always moved on, on the beginning of a rate cut cycle. Um, I think it's difficult for... Adrian, how are you? Well, I'm fine, thank you. Good to see you again since Boca. Yeah, it's really good to see you. And um, what a day to have an interview, or I should say what a week to have an interview. I must say is um, you've nailed a lot of things and you were looking at the Fed dot plot and um, we you mentioned a while ago you, they're going to cut in the summer. A little delayed, but we had a big cut that was somewhat of a surprise this week. I want to know your thoughts on that, why the Fed cut drastically? Are they late behind it? And if they're going to cut more and what that means for uh, the metal that we love? Yeah, okay. Well, we'll we'll try and read the Fed tea leaves, as it were. Um, yeah, I do think they left it a little bit late. Uh, but there's always there's always different timing issues. And, and since Jerome Powell has made it clear that he's data dependent, I, I guess he doesn't want to cut rates immediately after positive um, positive reports, economic reports. He's also a Fed chairman, as we know, who very much likes consensus. We did have one dissent on, on this 50 basis point cut, um, which is the first dissent he's had. Gosh, you know what? I don't know, but certainly several years. It's the first dissent in the Fed for several years. And we know that Jerome Powell is very keen on having consensus. So perhaps that's the reason that he waited. Um, I was surprised at 50. Yes, I thought it would be 25. Uh, but I, I don't think we should read into that, that they're going to be overly aggressive in cutting going forward. If you look at the dark plot, in fact, I think nine of them are, are looking at two 25 basis point cuts for the rest of the year, and seven of them are looking at only one 25 basis point cut, uh, and then there's, you know, one lower and two higher. So, yes, the, the mean would be looking for two 25 basis points, but it's by no means an overwhelming majority. So I think they're going to be cautious in cutting, uh, why did they go for 25? I, uh, rhetorical question. Um, I think, I think Powell and the rest of the Fed, presumably, I think they're concerned about unemployment or the employment picture. You know, that, that jobs revision that we saw last, last month of 818,000 jobs that were report, new jobs that were reported that apparently don't exist. I mean, first of all, that's just astonishing, but that had to sort of shake people who were basing their assumptions on a strong economy on strong employment and job growth. That had to throw people. And if you look at the last 12 months, as you and I talked before, if you look at the last 12 months, there's actually been a net loss. According to government figures, there's been a net loss of over a million dollars, a million jobs. It's about 1.2 million jobs of full-time private sector jobs, right? So all the jobs that have been created in the last 12 months, net, all the net jobs have been created have been either government or part-time. And to me, that's not a healthy economy. <laughs> that's a great point, by the way. Great point. Um, so I guess the next question is, is gold reaction is really to say the least has been very, very firm. And it looks like silver has been starting to follow here, starting to catch up. This is somewhat a rhetorical question, but I want you to answer it. Um, obviously, or what are your thoughts then on gold? <laughs> I, I was going to be snide English when they say, well, if it's rhetorical, you don't want me to answer, but <laughs> sorry about that. Can't help it. It's it's in the DNA. If you're English, it's in your DNA. Um, so yeah, um, interesting question and interesting, interesting thoughts around that because 
you know, part of me was thinking over the last several weeks, look, a raped cut is baked into the cake. Everybody knows it's coming, right? Are we going to have the buy the news, uh, 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 buy the rumor, sell the news event? Uh, and, and would gold actually not go up after the, after the Fed cut? Um, sorry, let me back up. As you know, as, every, as, as I think your listeners probably all know, but as you know, uh, every time they have embarked on a rate cutting cycle since 1980, so after the 1980, you know, after Paul Volcker uh, took, took, took T-bill rates or Fed funds rate up to nearly 20% and killed inflation. But after that particular rate cutting cycle, gold has always shot up immediately afterwards. So that's, that's the sort of, that's the background. Then I'm thinking, well, gold has already discounted this rate cut, surely. And then my third thought was, you know what? The reason gold has been going up for the last uh, two years and for, and for virtually all of this year, as we've talked about before and as everyone knows, is nothing to do with the macroeconomic environment. It's to do with central banks buying gold because of dollar weaponization. It's because of Chinese savers, uh, Chinese investors buying gold as a safe haven from their own domestic uh, concerns about the economy and the banking system. So gold... So, so in fact, even though the gold price moved up dramatically, one could argue that perhaps it wasn't actually discounting the interest rate cut. It was completely different other factors that were forcing it to go up. Uh, the Western investor, Western Europe and North America, they look at the macroeconomic environment and the macroeconomic environment until recently has actually not been favorable for gold. We must emphasize that. When people talk about, well, it's illogical that the gold stocks aren't going up, but gold is, and why is this, and blah, blah, blah. I mean, sorry, and, and, and so on. Um, it's not so illogical if you look at who was buying gold and why they were buying. Then look at the macroeconomic environment. Until recently, a strong dollar, not now, but, but high interest rates, high real interest rates, low and declining inflation, apparently, according to the government statistics, and according to the government statistics, a strong economy. And so until the last month or six weeks, and a strong stock market, which meant you didn't want to be buying gold stocks. So until the last sort of month or six weeks, there was really, really no particular incentive for a Western investor to say, I want to buy gold and gold stocks. The only incentive was that the darn thing was going up. Now, I th and I think you and I and other people in the gold community, we are so focused on this. We, we've looked under the hood. We see that the economy really isn't as strong as the statistics would tell us. We think that we know that the Fed is going to have to cut rates because the economy is slowing. We think inflation is not as weak as the government is saying. And so, you know, we've been saying, why doesn't gold move? But for the normal investor, um, all, all of all of all of this, all of the macro environment was not conducive to gold. That's now clearly beginning to change. We first of all we've had the rate cut. Gold always moves since 1980. Gold has always moved, or well, since after 1980, I should say. Gold has always moved on on the beginning of a rate cut cycle. Um, I think it's difficult for. Them some people might still think we're going to have a soft landing, but you don't hear people are talking about no landing anymore. I mean, it's clear that the economy is weakening or less strong than it was. I mean, in my view, it's weakening significantly, but, but no one can deny now when you look at those jobs revisions, when you look at credit card um, balances, credit card defaults, it's clear that particularly at the bottom half in terms of um, that's not a moral statement, bottom half in terms of income and assets, the bottom half of, of the U.S. is, is struggling. Um, and so it's clear that the economy is weakening. It's clear that, um, and, and I think it's also clear or becoming clear to people that inflation is not, is not a squat. And, you know, it's funny, not funny, it's not funny at all. 
But, you know, how the narrative from the Fed has changed over the last two years. I remember when they embarked on this two years ago, and for the first six months or so, Jerome Powell kept repeating, we're not going to cut rates until the inflation rate is at 2%. Then it was when it's moving towards 2%. Now it's when we're on a path towards 2%. We're not going to get to 2% on a, I don't think we're going to stay at 2% on a sustained basis. Uh, they've been helped a little bit recently by the oil price, of course, which has come down a lot. And, and oil, as, as you know, oil obviously is, is important, not just for uh, gasoline and for, for travel, but it feeds into the cost of every good that's in the store. So they've been, they've been helped a little bit in the last couple of months by that. Um, you know, we're not talking about oil here, but let's just say there's a reasonable possibility that that will reverse. So, I mean, I don't, I don't think, I think it's too early, and Powell himself said, it's too early to really say that, um, you know, in the, they've achieved their 2% target. Um, and 2% itself, of course, is, is, is a perverse target for a, for a Federal Reserve or any central bank whose objective is stable money. But that's, that's a whole different issue. So anyway, my point is that even though we in the gold community, you, me, and your listeners, you, I, and your listeners, we've been looking ahead and saying gold should be moving. You know, why aren't, why, why isn't the GLD getting massive inflows? Why aren't the stocks doing, doing better, et cetera. But the, the environment in that, in which that will happen is only just now beginning to be apparent to, to most people. Well said. Well said. So let me pivot just a little bit to stocks, uh, gold stocks. Um, we met, I met you at the Rule Symposium, and there were a lot of great companies there. Some of them you were interested in, very interested in. And then you just came back from uh, Beaver Creek. Correct me if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. What is, what was the mood at both? Well, not so much rule because you already, you already commented on that on a previous episode, but what was the mood at Beaver Creep among the, the gold companies there? And did any other companies stand out that you liked? Oh, good question. Well, as you know, there's two. Two gold conferences back to back in Denver in September. Uh, yes, where it meets. There's a Beaver Creek, which is primarily the junior companies, and then Denver, and then there's the Colorado Springs, uh, what used to be called the Denver Gold Forum, yep. um, which is the which focuses more on the senior companies. Um, certainly, the mood among attendees was far more optimistic. Not surprising, but certainly, and, and Beaver Creek had a record attendance. The attendees were still almost exclusively um, either dedicated gold investors, uh, gold funds, or family offices that had long had an interest in gold. There were very few new investors, generalists coming to the party. There were some, but very, very few. And, and I talked to every, everyone I had an interview with. I actually had 53 interviews over that time, 53 one-on-ones, which is quite a lot. So excuse me if I kind of get the companies mixed up until everything settles down. Um, but, but I, but I asked, I asked all of the companies I had, I had one-on-ones with, you know, if, if they had some new investors and yes, each company would say, well, you know, we had new people to our story, but very, very, very few said they had new investors to the gold space or people returning to the gold space, you know, after a period of, of, of years out of it. So that was in a way, a little bit surprising. Um, the, yeah, I think the mood, there's certainly a, there's certainly a strong mood among the companies as well as the investors looking for more M and a, um, obviously we've had a lot of M and a recently, uh, uh, we had we had a few uh, while while the shows were going on, and notably I guess Anglo Bank sentiment in Egypt, um, but 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 others as well. 
Um, and one of the themes, certainly, particularly among the junior companies, was talking about why their pro one of their projects or their company might be a good takeover target. You know, we're right next to Newmont, so Newmont might be interested, or we're right next to this, and you know, they need our part of the ground for their, um, uh, you know, for their for their decline or whatever it is. That was that was a big a big feature. Surprisingly, however, the major companies, even though we've had M and A, the major companies didn't really talk much about that. In fact, the only com major company I heard talking about M and A was um, Mark Bristow of Barrick, who repeated his mantra that you know we're not going to pay big premiums for M and A. We've got enough. Um, organic growth ourselves. Um, I think on one-on-ones, um, you know, that was perhaps a more balanced um, approach. But a lot of the companies, I mean, like Nego, for example, they said to me, you know, we're, 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 we're always looking, but we've got more than enough as, you know, we've got more than enough ourselves. We don't have to go out and, and buy okay. anything. Um, Clyde Johnson at B2 said the same thing. You know, we always look. But don't expect us to do anything. You know, we're just building one mine and, you know, we've got an expansion at another one. Um, so, yeah, yeah. I, I, but I think you'll continue to get M&A, frankly. Um, you know, it, it always goes up and down. Um, it's like you almost have to at these prices, right? And relative to the assets that are trading, so the juniors that are trading so cheap. That they're so cheap, but you know, also as I as I've said, the senior companies are still pretty under uh, not pretty. They're still undervalued. They're undervalued relative to their own historic price. They're undervalued relative to their own historic valuation, which mm -hmm. is more important. And they're undervalued relative to the gold price. Now, if you just look at, let's see if I have it up. Oh well, that's. That's one year, but let's look at this year. And you can see that in the second quarter, the gold price was, and I don't have the exact number, maybe you do, but I'm just, I'm just guessing looking at the graph, the gold price, average price in the second quarter was probably about $200, $220 an ounce higher than the average price in the first quarter. So That's no great. surprise that after a first quarter with strong cash flow, the second quarter saw even stronger cash flow for most of them. Now look at the third quarter that hasn't quite finished, but almost finished. And again, I'm, I'm estimating that the average price in this third quarter, in this quarter, is going to be about $150, $160 an ounce higher than the second quarter. What that means is that we should get, in the third quarter when they report, we should get even stronger cash flows from yeah. the producing companies. Now look at the valuations. You look at Agnigo Eagle at the end of the second quarter after the, you know, two back-to-back -back quarters of strong cash flows, trading at about, and I don't have it pulled up, but trading at about eight times cash flow. Look back <laughs> over their 40-year history. They've been lower than that for one quarter in 2016, for one quarter in 2015. I mean, we are very, very close to a 40 year low in terms of price to cash flow for Agnigo. And Agnigo is a good company to look at because, you know, there's no hairs on that. There's, there's nothing wrong with that company. You can't look at, you know, people look at Barrick and say, oh, well, that's cheap because they're in Pakistan. Right. That's cheap because they just did the merger, Newmont. Oh, well, that's cheap because they have a lousy balance sheet. You can't say any of those things about Agnigo. And and yet the valuation is is close to its low, and so when we have the third quarter with one hundred and fifty, one hundred sixty dollars an ounce higher gold price and the oil price lower, that's the other thing. Look, and the oil price, as you know, is the number one cost input for miners. So if they're getting the cost should be lower. Certainly, the revenue line will be higher, and so unless Agnigo moves significantly higher. It's going to be trading at a 40 year low in terms of price to cash flow, which simply doesn't make sense. Right. Look at Barrick again. Oh, there goes the thunder. Look at Barrick. 
Yeah, we know they're in Mali. We know they're in Saudi Arabia. We know they're building a mine in Pakistan, for goodness sake, where there's a Balochistan, you know, liberation front or something. But still, Barrick is trading at close, again, close to a 40-year low in terms of price to net asset value um, and in terms of uh, price to book. Not the same thing, of course. And Barrick, um, I think it was either 1200 or 1250 I, I should, sorry, one of the two, at which they are valuing their reserves. So, and of course, most of the companies, most of the companies, uh, the, the gold as price assumption lags, lags the market price. That's, that's standard for the big companies. But Barrick is, is, is way more conservative than most of them. I mean, imagine if they just decided to say, well, we'll value our reserves at 1600, right. which would still be ridiculously undervalued. Right. Yep. But, but, you know, and so, and so for them to be trading at such a low multiple to the net asset value, I, I, again, there are reasons, you know, they're more, they have a much higher political risk profile. We just saw they had to shut down the mine in Papua New Guinea, uh, temporarily because of, of, um, civil strife there. Um, but, but nonetheless, um, it, it's, it, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's, it's perverse that it's selling close to a 40 year low in terms of, uh, it's, it's price to asset. Yeah. That is such a great point. And it's just beyond me, but it's good. It's an opportunity for, uh, a new investor or somebody that wants exposure to these markets. Uh, Absolutely. And can I just interrupt a second? Please. Sorry, I don't mean to just talk the whole time, but just interrupt a second. Typically when gold bottoms and moves, the gold stocks will typically have a very dramatic outperformance in the first two, three, four, five, six months. And just an example, in 2000, 2001, you saw that gold, I think, in the first three months after the bottom was up like 12%, the gold stocks were up over 50%. This is a very, very unusual and very, very uh, attractive opportunity for investors. As you say, we've had gold at new all-time highs, gold... I'm, I'm sorry, it's, I mean, everybody knows how much has gone up in the last two years. We've seen dramatic performance from gold in the last couple of years. Gold and the gold stocks are more or less up the same amount over the last 12 months. Yeah. Uh, very, very unusual. You would expect with gold having gone up, uh, you know, 36% in the last year, and more if you go back two years, but 36% in the last year, it's a new all turn highs. You would expect typically for the gold stocks to be up 50 to 100%. Yeah. So people have a very, very unusual and attractive opportunity right now. They're not. Yeah. And to give context on this, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I was talking to a friend of mine just the other day and he said he wouldn't be a professional. He said he wouldn't be surpri uh, surprised if Barrick or Newmont are, uh, Operating at about fifty percent margins at this price, <laughs> crazy to me. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, the all-in costs are for you know the all-in costs are fourteen to fifteen hundred. Um. So yeah, the margins are remarkably strong, and again, the third quarter margin should be even stronger. Even yeah. 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 Well, let's, if we can, any new projects, and again, I'm not trying to pry, I know so many have pitched so much, more than almost anybody in the industry, but any new projects at um, Beaver Creek that stood out, or even you can go back to uh, the Rule Symposium, anything yes. that's not Well, we did talk at Rule, I think, about the Silicon Merlin project of, of Origin and Altius. Yes, we did. Which, which you, you know, I still, even though the stocks have moved up, I still think it continued to be... That's a very, very, I mean, that's a very, very attractive, um, uh, deposit. And, and so I think those two stocks, you know, are, are still attractive. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I still think Agnigo is by far the best of the big companies. It's not the cheapest by any means, but it's, it's clearly the best mm -hmm. in terms of management risk profile reserve, um, uh, um, you know, pipeline, 
um, in good jurisdictions and a good balance sheet. Um, you know, I, two I would just highlight, I guess, I don't know if we talked about Fortuna in March and the other one would be B2 Gold. B2 Gold has been, was until last week, um, really hit by the market because they had cost overruns at this new mine they're building in the Yukon. They had problems. Their largest mine is in Mali. And, you know, all these press reports about Mali might be the new uh, military government there might be wanting to nationalize the mines. Um, so, so two things happened. They, they, in the last couple, three things happened in the last, uh, 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 week. One is they came to an agreement with the Mali government. They have to pay more, but it's a clear, it's a clear agreement now. And, and the beauty of that is not just that they now have clarity and the market has clarity, but along with that agreement, they got a permit to explore regionally and also they're going to begin trucking ore from deposits around the Fakola mine facility. And even though they have to pay a little more to the government, they don't have to build, they don't have to build new facilities. So, so that's a positive for, for B2. Um, not all of the companies operating Mali, um, are going to benefit from a higher, a higher, you know, was well, tax rate and ownership by the government, but, but in B2's gold in particular. B2's case in particular, it is because of the regional exploration and the regional deposits that they can now start trucking. So that's one thing. The second thing was they came out with a new uh, cost estimate on the Goose Bay up in Yukon. Um, it's, it's higher. I think it's about, don't quote me on this, about 23% higher than the previous estimate. So not good, but. Now they have said this, this is it, you know, we now, we now know what we're working with and we're going to complete the mine. And incidentally, they're going to complete the mine on time, just as a higher cost base. We could talk more about why there were the cost overruns, but in a, if you wanted to, but in a way, um, um, not, not, not overly important. I don't think, let's just say, I don't think it was completely B2's fault that they had those cost overruns. And then the third thing, of course, is that they had a boost in the allocation in the GDXJ. So all of those things coming together, solving the problems that were, were weighing on the stock, and then also getting added to the GDX, B2's had a huge jump. That's huge. Um, but frankly, still a very, very good company, strong balance sheet, um, and, and, um, Good, good outlook. Um, and then Fortuna, you know, Fortuna continues to do very well. Um, again, over the last few years, they've had various problems. Some of their making, some not of their making, most not of their making, but I mean, things go wrong with mines. So they had equipment failures at, at, uh, at Lindero, and then they decided to expand the leech, which was big capital investment, um, uh, not being, uh, you know, and, and, and the whole economic situation in Argentina, where you can't take your profits out of a country. Then we had the San Jose, um, farce where the government, you know, kept trying to revoke the license or, you, you know, and they kept going to court and winning and then the government, the, the environmental agency would do something else. But anyway, um, a lot of these things was, oh, and then they had the power outages in Ivory coast. I mean, all these things I'm talking about, equipment failures, environmental permitting, um, I, uh, uh, power outages, it sort of, it, it, it emphasizes to us what Robert Friedland said about mining, you know, in mining, Murphy works overtime, right? Things do go wrong in mining. We have to remember that mining is a very, very difficult business and things do go wrong. Um, but now you've got the situation where they're probably going to put the mine, the San Jose, so the, the current mine reserve is running out. They're probably going to put it on care of maintenance for a while. Um, and, and maybe if they can get some more, uh, a bigger reserve, they'll go back and start mining. But at least, at least at the moment, those are very, very high cost ounces because they're continuing to mine, but they're mining fewer ounces. So therefore your, your fixed costs are amortized over, um, a, a lower number of ounces. So if they actually stop producing it from, um, from San Jose in Mexico, 
that will that will enable their overall company costs to come down. And then in, in Argentina, the expansion is now basically finished. So the capital costs are finished. So again, we should, and, and under accounting rules, they've had to expense those costs, right? Okay. But, you, you know, we think of them as capital costs. The company thinks of them as capital costs, but, you know, they had to expense them. And so right. the ounces at Lindero were very high. Now those costs are finished. Uh, the average cost of, of mining at uh, Lindero should come down. And then in the Ivory Coast, they built their own generators so they can now continue. Uh, they can now continue operating even if the power goes out uh, in the country. Um, but again, the costs of building that generator were expensed. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so, yeah, things should, things should. You know, things are turning around, have been turning around for, for, for tuna operationally, but, but now things, uh, should, you know, continue to turn around in a very, very strong way. And both of the two I mentioned, B2 and, and Fortuna, mid tier companies with multiple mines, um, are both, I think, undervalued relative to their peers. Okay. Excellent. Adrian, um, if somebody wants to do business with you, how do they find you and how do they do business with you? Yeah, well, I have a newsletter, um, which is just a regular subscription newsletter. And then I have, um, obviously, I, I manage money. Well, I say obviously. I manage money for, for clients. We manage both in gold and also in global equity. So a lot of the, most of our clients are actually, uh, you know, more conservative in the global space, but they want exposure to, to gold. But we do also do dedicated gold accounts. Um, uh, the best place to go is, is uh, adrianday.com. And then it'll point you in whichever direction you want to go. Excellent. I'll put all of this in the show notes. Adrian, I want to thank you so much uh, for your time. It's always such a pleasure. There's always so many nuggets in there. And you need to uh, get out of the office and go make sure you're dry and uh, safe and uh, miss the storm. <laughs> it's coming. Have you heard the storm? Have you heard the rumbling? I didn't hear it, but I'm like, I got to get you out of there, man. Are you going to get it's soaked? <laughs> um, are you going to New Orleans? I am not, but that's oh. for all of our listeners. That's, and you don't remember this, but there was night, I want to say 95. I want to say that's where I first met you. As just, I was such a young kid then. And uh, uh, we were both much younger then. Yes, um, yes, yes. <laughs> but uh, as of right now, I'm not. I'm going to another one in October. If there's one in October that I'm going to. Um, but I just, uh, it's, it's tough being a family man as you are too, but it's tough. You being know, a oh, you can't do a mold. You can't do can't a mold. Do all. <laughs> no. That's my good. Well, we'll I see you on one of these shows. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again for your time, Adrian. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye.